All right, so go ahead, everyone. Introduce yourself. Tell us what you can do much better than anyone. Okay, Favor is a believer. Um, I believe Favor is uh, a lady. So she's passionate about being all God wants her to be. A real estate agent helps men attain financial freedom in the future by investing in secured real estate. Fantastic. Okay. Okay. And Taufik is in the room. Hey, Taufik. Okay. Founder and CEO of Vanguard Pharmacy. Yes, it's okay to um, let us all know your companies. Uh, part of why I start with this is that I would like all of us to connect. And then sometimes in, the, in my meetings, people have actually um, landed some very big connections and uh, networks. So you need to get to know yourselves and then what you do. So people can know how to connect with you. So let's keep it coming. Let's keep it coming. Let's have some more. Okay. Introduce yourself. Tell us what you do, how people can connect with you, what you can do for people. Okay. Um, Charles, you're welcome. All right. Charles can create knowledge like no one else. That's amazing. We have some incredible people in the room. All right. Okay. Keep it going. Keep it going. Let's do two, three more minutes. Let's know ourselves. Let's know the people in the room because we are starting it. We're going to do, we're going to go on a journey, an amazing journey today together. Okay, who else is in the room? Who else is in the room? Okay. Father Remy is a pharmacist, passionate about helping people be in charge of their health. Awesome. Awesome. All right, so let's keep it going. Kalta, these are my people. Kalta is in the room. Amazing. <laughs> Hello, Kalta. That's Vanguard Pharmacy. Amazing, amazing. All right, so welcome, everybody. There's just so much to talk about tonight. I'm so excited about this dinner. Uh, somebody, somebody has said it's um, dinner without uh, food, that I was trying to be smart. Um, not really. At some point, we will start eating food. But the origin of the business dinner chat was actually, um, I, actually, that should read 2020 or 2021, not 2022, as you see in our logo, because this was when the world was in a lockdown. And um, Yes, yeah, so we wanted to connect. We were all hung, uh, hungry for that face-to-face -face connection that we missed in 2020. So that's when we actually started the business dinner chat. We had a couple of editions before we went off air. <laughs> um, after the, 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 the lockdown was over. But I thought that, um, yeah, we need to continue having that chat. And today we are going to look at rebuilding and restructuring value. Uh, because in my space, I have seen how much businesses are struggling since after the COVID era. And while we were trying to recover from COVID, um, a lot of other economic conditions and situations you know, came in uh, especially inflation, uh, the people's buying power going down, uh, currency devaluation. Um, I remember going to Ghana, um, a trip to Ghana sometime early this year. And then the stores had stopped putting price tags on their, on their goods. And the reason was prices were changing. I think it started before it came to Nigeria. So the prices were changing so rapidly that you will go into a store and buy something for 40 cities uh, today or in the morning. And then by evening, it has become 45 cities and things like that. I didn't know it was coming to Nigeria until I went to the stationery store where I usually buy uh, my stationery and stationery for my programs. 
Um, and lo and behold, there were no price tags in all the SKUs in that retail store. I asked them why they gave me the same reason that the prices change very rapidly. And so the effect of that is that many businesses are losing value very, very rapidly. And then some have actually outrightly gone out of business because you could no longer sustain production. And people in manufacturing were particularly hit, especially those who have to source raw materials you know, from abroad, from China or from Europe or from the United States. So um, you buy the raw materials you used to buy, uh, you know, fifty thousand uh, dollars, and then you used to exchange or to get the naira at say five hundred naira to the dollar, and then all of a sudden naira jumps to eight hundred, and the market still expects you to sell at that same price that you were manufacturing. So businesses have been struggling. And so this is going to be the setting for tonight's dinner chat. Okay, so my name is Ogbo Awoke Ogbo. A um, couple of you here. Um, I've worked with a couple of you here. So you, you already know. But for those who don't know a little bit of my story, I began my career with Shell, SPDC, what I caught as remote sensing surveyor, um, worked with Shell. And uh, while I was in Shell, Chevron came and made an offer that I couldn't say no to. So I went to Chevron in Lagos. And um, while I was in Chevron, after six years in Chevron, you know, Shell came back and then made another offer. That was at that time, like, double what Chevron was <laughs> paying. Um, so I didn't pray too much um, about it. I left Chevron and went back to Shell. And then while I was in Shell for the second time, this time I was in Snapco um, mm -hmm. in Lagos. I had an assignment in Netherlands while I was there at Shell's international office, I had an epiphany because um, by this time, I had started losing a lot of interest in the oil and gas uh, industry. It was a great job, of course, you know, with Shell, but I just found myself having this very deep uh, discontent, you know, job was good, but I wasn't feeling fulfilled at all. So while I was in that room, uh, that hotel room in Holland, Rijswijk, I asked myself, um, what were the 100 things I would like to accomplish before I died? And then I made, I made a list of the things I would like to do before I died. Because I said, if I sat in my deathbed and then look behind me, would, what, would, what would make me say my life had been accurately and worthily lived? What would make me go to my grave with a lot of deep satisfaction? And I found that certainly just saying, oh, he had a very good job with Shell and then he built some houses in the village and then trained his children abroad and things like that, you know? So I said, that would be terrible. That would be so pitiful. If that's all that would be said about me as I'm dying. So, I now ask the follow-up question. If I stayed in Shell, even though it was a great job, would I be able to accomplish these 100 things on my list? And then the answer, answer was very, very doubtful. So I now made, um, you know, what I call a T-shaped thinking um, framework and said, if I stayed in Shell in the next 10 years, what were the pros and cons versus if I stayed, uh, if I left Shell, in the next 10 years. So I weighed both sides and I discovered that both sides were risky. Staying in Shell was risky, leaving Shell was risky. So when I came back, as Providence would have it, Shell was doing their usual selective voluntary severance. So I took the package and left Shell to do um, what I am doing today.
In the recent past, I've worked as business advisor and facilitator for Stanford Graduate School of Business. They have an initiative they call Stanford Seed in Africa and Southeast Asia. And, um, you know, that was really the highlights and high points of one of those things I said I wanted to do before I die, helping businesses in this part of the world, you know, to discover their potential and to pursue that. And I'm also very passionate about people work. People are everything. People are everything. You know, people matter. People are everything. So that's a little about me. What do you expect tonight? At the end of tonight, um, I'm very certain about three things that will happen. One is you're going to change the way you currently think. Okay, I'm very sure about that. And that's always the aim of all the things that I do, you know, to help people to challenge the way people think about themselves, about their businesses, about the environment, about the things going on around them. And then hopefully you will change the way you look at your business in a very, very tangible and measurable way. And then get your notebooks ready because you're going to experience an explosion. When I call it explosion, that's what it is, of ideas and insights that you're going to begin to implement in your business tomorrow morning as a, or as a matter of fact this night. Um, I can predict that some of us here would not sleep this night until about 3 or 4 a.m. It's going to happen. I would like you to come back to the chat and say that that happened to you. And the reason is because you're going to stay awake to work on the insights that you're going to generate that you're going to generate today. Um, I have taught some of you how to take notes because taking notes is a very powerful discipline. It's, very, it's a transforming, transformational habit, but it depends on how you take notes because when we take notes in a very poor way, what usually happens is that we just take the notes and then we abandon the notes you know, somewhere and we never look at it. But there's a way to take notes to that ensure that the insights you captured are actually acted upon. Because for many of us sitting in this program, if you had acted on all the notes you've taken, some really power notes you've taken in events like this, at school, the business school, during the company meetings, during your retreats, during workshops, um, you probably will be in a different place than where you are today. So these are the three things that I'm very certain will happen tonight. So be very, very open. They are going to come at you. So I was talking about how you take notes. So you take notes, you, you, you draw a line at the middle of your page, and then the left side, you take notes for your left brain. So typically all the things I'm saying, you might hear some particular phrase or quotation or something you hear me say, then you can capture that verbatim. Okay, that's the way you take notes for the left brain. You just capture what I'm saying uh, verbatim, the ideas I'm sharing. Then on the right-hand side, you take your notes for your right brain. And the note you take on the right-hand side, uh, the ideas, the images, the things that will be coming to your mind that are completely unrelated to the specific things I said, but something I say will trigger a particular image, trigger a thought, trigger something completely unrelated, seemingly unrelated to what I'm discussing capture that note in the right-hand side. That's where you're going to find the secret of transformation. Okay. And then at any particular point, um, now I want this to be very, very interactive because in dinner, I'm not eating alone. We are all eating. And then um, as our plates are moving, we are also having a conversation. So this is more like a conversation than it is um, a lecture which was why I had wanted all of you to feel the Google form that um, I gave you. Okay, so now I said that this is gonna be very, very participatory. So I want everyone in the chat 
to participate. So go to the chat right now and then type the obstacles you're facing in your business today. What are the obstacles? Just type them. So let's all learn together. And then since we're all business leaders, it's important that we see and then interact on this. Okay, everybody, every single person, type something in the chat. Every single person. Okay, so what I'm going to do is copy what you have in the chat to so that we can see, everybody can see typing. All right, so we have scaling, slow sales. Okay, scaling. Keep going, keep going, everybody. Everybody participate. This is participatory. Okay, everybody participate. Slow sales, low sales, visibility. Okay, low sales, how to pivot. All right. Keep going, keep going, everybody. All right, scaling and funding. Keep going, keep going, because that's going to have not enough inventory. This is going to help uh, very, very strongly attracting uh, low ticket clients. Um, I'm going to ask you to explain that a little bit more. Wilson, I'm coming back to you. But let me capture, all right? Uh, personnel, uh, Rosalind, I believe, is the same thing as staffing. Okay, so for some of you, I'm going to come back to you to ask you. Okay, so funding. Funding comes up again, competitive pressure. Okay, everybody keep going, keep going. You can have more than one obstacle. Um, you can, you can. All right, people management and low sales, uh, the bank has said. Um, competitive pressure, is there anything I'm missing? How to pivot from my current value to seven more clients? Okay, low sales, slow sales, scaling. All right. Um, let me come to you, Wilson. When you say attracting low ticket clients, are you saying um, you have something for high ticket, but the low ticket people are coming? Is that can you just unmute uh, briefly and then tell us what you mean, Wilson? Okay, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, yeah. What I mean is, I have um, services that I offer to high ticket clients, but low um, ticket um, clients keep coming to price such services lower than yeah. the, the threshold. Okay, fantastic. Yeah, that's a challenge that um, many of us um, have also faced. Uh, especially, um, are you in are you in services or product business? I'm into services. Okay, in services, yeah. Okay, so that's very um, typical, you know, sometimes. And then I'm sure we're going to share some ideas on being able to deal with that. All right, I don't see any more in the chat. I think I've captured all of it. But let me see. Um, Sam, can you tell me the nature of the competitive pressure you're talking about? Please unmute and tell us. Sam? Um, yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, um, so basically we, I'm in the retail space and we, we are having a lot more competitors, you know, all over the place. Um, the numbers are increasing by, already by the, by the week these days. Yeah. And um, of course, you know, that, so that's driving up a lot more competition and decreasing margins, you know, so profit margins decreasing by application. And so a lot more pressure from that end. Okay, um, so does it look like your line of business? Does it look like the line of business has um, low barrier to entry? Um, yes, in a way, low barrier to entry, but I think um, there's also a lot more capital heading in that direction these days. Okay, 
All right. So I think people, uh, a lot of people, people think more is more attractive. So there's a lot more capital heading in that direction. So right. that's part of the issue. Uh, Lawrence, how does not enough inventory um, relate to funding? Does it have anything to do with funding or the availability of your SKUs? Can you omit and tell us? So Lawrence, I say something about uh, not inventory. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> In a way, it is um, linked to funding. But sometimes in my, in my line of industry, it's the only fund that you need. You can have access to the supplier service. But, but that's what I've not been able to say. All this one. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, what I see, what I find very interesting from all the things on the list here, um, what I find very interesting is that nobody actually says, and I, I also like that, nobody actually says, um, most of the things I see here are not really things outside of your, your control. So when I look at scaling, low sales, visibility, pivoting, scaling, not enough inventory, um, I don't see anything that is outside of your control here. So that's good news. That's good news. Now, second thing, I don't see anything here that businesses have not gone through before and then effectively dealt with. Um, so this is good, just nailing it. Um, okay, so I want to... I also want us to reflect on one more, one more question, right? Why are we bad at predicting the future? Okay, because part of this is um, what we're going through in the business world today. And I know there's a little bit of undertone of the economic challenges that we're having, the challenges we're having in the economy right now. I know that there are, you know, that's, there's an undertone to that here when we talk about slow sales, low sales, um, low sales capital fund, uh, working capital funding. Um, so that undertone is there. But um, let's go somewhere with it. So when you look at this, the prognosis for many businesses does not look great. You know, when you look at low sales, you look at funding, funding, you look at personal challenges, working capital, and all that. So the prognosis doesn't look very, very exciting. But so, so it's very, very like default that people will say, okay, the prognosis is not very exciting. And therefore, my business has a very, very challenging future. But we're not really sure. We're not really sure. I always say make room for, and nevertheless, always make room for however, okay? Yes, this is that way, but however. But can anybody say um, why we humans are very bad at predicting the future? Okay, recently I was sharing, even like in the case of our, you know, for some of us in this in the call who are Nigerians, in the case of our politics, um, I was very, uh, very, very certain what happened in 2014. Nigerians were like 80% certain that once Muhammad Buhari was, uh, came into government, that Nigeria's problem problems would be over, that everything about corruption was going to be destroyed because this was a general. And this guy had only 150 cows uh, since he was uh, head of state. He didn't steal any money as a PTF. And so he had all that, everything looked great. And Nigerians said, and people, people use their money to campaign for him in the north, in the south. But then eight years after, this is where we are, okay? Um, then again, I was also sharing recently how 
you will find it very difficult you know, to predict the future. So I said, this is why we now have a rise in the prophetic business in Nigeria, and in fact, in many parts of Africa, and then a rise in Sears. It's amazing the past couple of months, you know, how many people have um, advised me to go and see it, so some seer or the other. It's just incredible. So there are people, they call them seers, you know, they see the future for you and things like that. But then when we finish, um, yes, thank you. Thank you, Charles, for reminding me. So, but then we find that we are not very good at predicting the future, even when it comes to business, even when it comes to business, you know, and that's why sometimes many strategies fail because people have done environmental scanning and then sometimes in the all kinds of biases you know you know predictive models and strategic thinking that um that sabotage our progress as a business so can anybody you can unmute or you can type in the chat why are humans bad at predicting the future all right so let's see what's in the chat because the future is somewhat unpredictable, okay, right? Because they don't look back at the past, mm -hmm. at the past, or they choose to forget the past, okay? The elders say tomorrow is pregnant. We don't know what it will deliver. Low creativity, okay? Mm -hmm. For businesses, the economic instability makes it difficult to predict the future. One policy from the government can ruin every prediction through that true because sometimes we don't actively sit down to look into what the future from the experience of our past and because we aren't god okay favor says uh chikazia says we always use the past meanwhile we can be more if we try thank you all very 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 brilliant answers and you see it's because of what you say that i have a somewhat different um approach to the future yes i participate in the stochastic models and um it's also important you know to do strategic thinking i lead organizations you know with strategic thinking i just finished with uh, Boca heart i don't know if anybody in Boca heart is here and then next week i'm going to do exactly the same thing with the uh nc dmb um i've done i've done similar things with flutter wave i've done you know this year quite a number of companies that will show us later now so we do that but um i have developed an approach that while you are doing some st stochastic modeling you also uh focus more on creating the future which you want and then for some of you i've worked with here you remember very well, um, you know, our exercises in dream weaving. So that's an attempt to both use a stochastic model and then to determine ourselves what is the future that we want and then how do we go about creating that future so, so that instead of the future coming to us by default, instead of me trying to go to a prophet, or a prophetess to ask her, am I going to be rich or, uh, and, and successful? Can you read my palm and tell me if I'm going to be successful? Instead of doing that, I said, okay, what does success look like for me? What is the future I want? And then I start from here to create it. Now, this attitude is very important and I'm, and I'm preparing the ground for what we are going to be doing and discussing and working on today so uh, on that note i want to show you a couple of businesses you know that have lasted uh, for centuries and then you will see how all these things have been talking about you know come together now um when i did my executive coaching certification um in sarasota in florida um my mini project you know for certification was on businesses, especially family businesses that had lasted for hundreds of years, you know. So I looked at, and I've been very, very curious ever since about companies that have lasted for 300, 200, 500, 1,000, and even more than 1,000 years. And I said that if we can crack, if the businesses today can crack 
the, the, the essence of the longevity of these businesses that we might start to see similar things here in Africa because in our own environment here, and the many of us here are business owners and founders. If we, most times, once the founder dies, the business dies, dies with it. You know, of course, everybody knows the saddest one is uh, the MK Abiola business empire. If they had told anybody in 1979 or mid 1980s that Abiola empire, Abiola's empire, business empire that was flourishing, doing incredible things, you know, in those days, that in 2022, children born 20 years ago would never even have heard about, about Abiola's empire. It would have been unbelievable. It's just like saying today, you know, we hear about Dangote and then something happens to Dangote tomorrow. And then all of a sudden, we don't have the Dangote sugar, the refinery, the everything. So hopefully, um, Dangote has learned some of the things that I'm going to be sharing with you this evening to just make sure that in another 100 years and 200 years, his business will still be there. So the oldest recorded business in the world is uh, Congo Gumi which started in 578 AD. That was way, 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 way long before your grandmother was born. Um, so this company, as of this year, is 1,444 years. And it has passed on through about 53 generations. And these people have been in business constantly since that time. It was started by some three craftsmen. If you go to their website, they actually have a very, very interesting story that were invited from one part of the uh, one, one part to, of Japan to another. And then they started with building temples, which is what they are still doing up to today. That's their phone number you know, right there. 1,444 year old business has seen everything, has seen everything. Um, then there's this other restaurant in the in Austria. So um, which started, my camera is covering the year 803, all right, which started in 803. So by this year, St. Peter, Steve's Kundalinium <laughs> um, is 1,219 years. And that photograph you see there is a photograph of a, a restaurant that has seen 1,000, has seen more than one millennium and two centuries. I mean, how does this make you feel? You know, that you see a business with us today that has seen a history that spans nearly 1,500 years. Can you type in the chat just how it makes you feel? And then a restaurant. In fact, this restaurant, they say that it served um, Christopher Columbus had eaten there. <laughs> um, so from the records of people who have been in there, it, they had served Christopher Columbus and a couple of other world renowned figures, you know, as far back as that time. How does this make you feel, anybody? I just want to capture how, how do seeing a business that has lasted this this long, how does it make you feel? Type in the chat. Type in the chat. What emotions? Okay, okay. Anything can be done. Yeah. Sam said not sure because uh, you didn't complete that, Sam. Okay, yeah, I feel the awe as well. Um, banking, I feel the awe. I feel the awe. And I really want us to soak into that emotion, yeah, possibility. Okay, thank you, Wilson, possibility. Okay. Yeah, I feel the awe too. Um, I was in my farm a couple of months ago and I saw this woman, this village woman with her 
daughter-in-law going to their farm. This woman, from what she told me, from what she told me, you know, she was still very strong, but you could see all the wrinkles. I mean, this woman was old, but she was strong. She was strong because she was walking by herself and she was going to the, to the farm. And you could see all the wrinkles, all the wrinkles all over the whole place. So you just wonder. And I'm like, okay, when I saw this woman, I think what you said, um, who said oh, all right? Um, yeah, somebody said, you know, just, yeah. They all, there was a presence because you're, you're like seeing uh, a historical, a historically significant spirit standing before you. And I was sure that this woman was in her 90s. So I left where I was and I ran to this woman and said, mommy, I just, I brought out money. I just brought out money from my pocket. And I say, mama, I want to give you this, you know, I, I just want to give you this money, you know. Um, and I said, how old are you? Of course, she didn't know, but she said that she had her last baby before, he said before the white people, before the white people left Nigeria or something, that before the white people had it, there was a way she explained it that apparently she, that she was talking about um, 1960. She had had her last child before 1960, you know, her last child. So meaning that some of her uh, older children are in their 70s. So this woman was in her 90s, you know, I just felt that kind of awe. You know, so when I, so I studied these businesses, I look at their pictures, I read stories about these businesses that have been 1,200, 1,400 years for the same reason. Now, um, okay, so the Congo Gumi, um, there are others I picked from different parts of the world, okay? There is the Staffelta Hof, a winery in Germany that started in 862. There is the mint in France, um, 864. There is the mint in England, 886. Um, there is a bar, a pub that started in 900 AD in Ireland. They have been in business continuously to today. Uh, the, uh, this other one in Italy, 1040. Then I tried I looked at something in Nigeria, you know, and uh, yeah, First Bank, uh, 1894. Though it didn't start as First Bank, I'm trying to remember what the what that bank was, you know, um, started by the colonists. But it, it's been there for 128 years. I think there's also a Labuku. A Labuku, but it's not a company, it's a product. There's a company behind the product, though. A Labuku was 1914. So there's some little bit of longevity. But Nigeria has had some really great businesses that started in the 50s and the 60s that are no more today. Some in the 70s that are no more today. When I was growing up, I still remember the Okonkwo and Sons, West Africa Limited kind of businesses. You see them in Onisha, you see them in the village and different places. Okeke and Sons, West Africa. And they were trading indeed in West African countries and different places, but today they are no more. So now my question is, um, do you think that in 1,440 years or even 100 years, like Mercedes-Benz, like Ford, uh, like General Electric, 100 and something years, like Cadbury, that's 190 something years, like Shell. Do you think that these businesses have seen any political troubles? Just type in the chat. <laughs> Do you think that they have seen any wars? Just type in the chat. What, which, of, which one, as I mentioned the list, which ones you think that they have not seen, all right? or that they have seen refugees and displacement, women disenfranchisement. Where is racism? I didn't put racism there. Racism, inequalities, oppression, harsh economic operating environment, terrorism, bad government, pandemic, currency crisis, natural disasters, moral decadence in the society, migration crisis like Jack Ma we are having right now, brain drain, just type in the chat. 
any of these things you think that this, a business that has lasted for 100, for 1,440 years, puts, if there's anything here that they haven't seen, please put it in the chat. Let's see. <laughs> Put it in the chat. Okay, Larry, thank you. Uh, Barclays Bank, that's what uh, First Bank was. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. They've seen all of this. They've seen all of this, all of this. They've seen fire. They've seen, in fact, even the ones that are 100 years old, all the businesses that are 100 years old, like the Mercedes-Benz itself. I think Mercedes-Benz was... Uh, 1901, 1902. Uh, soon after that, um, in less than 20 years, they had the First World War. And while they were still trying to recover from the First World War, they there was this horrible currency devaluation in Germany. The Dutch mark became like pure water. You could use like two wheelbarrows to buy a loaf of bread. They have seen it all. And then they saw a Hitler. And they saw a second world war. They saw the partitioning of the of the country. Um, they saw all of that, but that company is still alive today. This is what oh, part of the reason I do what I do. Politics might be sweet. Politics might be powerful. Like right now, everybody is talking about politics and all that, and then we have all these political champions. But I tell you that entrepreneurship, that well-run businesses, outlive politics and they do more good in the society eventually than these politicians okay now therefore it's not what is happening outside in the world it's not what's happening in the economy or in political uh, settings it's what's happening in between your ears that will determine whether you will thrive and overcome all the obstacles and hindrances that we mentioned at the beginning or not okay and then one of the things that Kongo Gumi did in my study that I found very, very interesting, the 32nd generation, the 32nd head of the family wrote out um, what he called a will to be passed to future generations. And this is something interesting about uh, the, many Japanese businesses. Because I remember Brian Tracy interviewing a Japanese businessman. I think he was um, CEO of a bank. And then he asked him if he had a business plan. He said, yes, that he has a business plan for 300 years. And Tracy was like, 300 years? You are not going to be around in 300 years. He said, that is why he has that plan today. So what I have seen as a strategic weakness for most of us in Africa and in this part of the world is inability for sustained thinking, for long-term thinking. And then when people start a business today and then they just have a windfall all of a sudden, six, nine months, they make something like $1 million, which is now like uh, 800 million Naira. <laughs> um, immediately they will build house, they will buy a yacht, they will take their families and their friends or whatever to Dubai. They will do their wedding in Dubai. They will chatter just and things like that. But these people do not behave that way. So there's a very, very strong sense of culture and succession. These people, so in 1801, somebody saw the future, said, look. Um, and if you look at what he wrote there, he wrote, family precepts of the Congo family. He wrote down precepts. Now, knowledge of craftsmen, reading and practice of, of the abacus, show compassion to your sub subordinates and serve them with gentle words. Write down an honest estimate and give it to them. Important things that should not be neglected every day, even if they seem obvious at first glance. So if you look at what's going on here, you understand the essence of why Peter Drucker said that culture will have strategy for breakfast, will eat strategy for breakfast. There's nothing really he's talking about here that is more like culture or operations or sales and marketing. But everything he, he put here 
you know, is around culture, around value, around character. Okay. And um, so take note of that, you know, how important that is in creating a business that will outlive you. So now we're talking about rebuilding and um, restructuring value. So there are three things that I learned from these organizations and then three things that each of us sitting here can do for our businesses to make sure that the values that um, we are creating are being captured. And also to make sure that we are creating values faster than it's being destroyed. So there are three key responses. The first one is leadership, all right? And the kind of leadership that will do it for you through these very difficult times is adaptive leadership, okay? You are aligning your vision and mission and strategy, your people and your culture. You are constantly managing the performance, you know, the organizational performance, the people performance, the financial performance, and then you're doing dynamic restructuring. Now, what is dynamic restructuring? I found it very interesting that when I worked with Shell, every time Shell had like, they used to have five-year uh, business strategy, five-year business goals um, at that time. Every time they defined a five-year new business strategic goals, Shell would always restructure. They always restructured. When I left Shell and came to Chevron, Chevron was doing exactly the same thing. After every four years or five years, I don't know if they still do it. They restructure the business because anytime you come up with new strategic goals, you must restructure your, the organization to be able to pursue the new strategic goals. Because what people are doing is the, you are using, some of us are doing, we are using the same organizational structure that we used when the business was formed 20 years ago. And we've been changing strategy and we're wondering why we are not scaling. You cannot scale when you do not create the structure that allows you to scale into your new strategic uh, initiatives. And that's the, that's the role of leadership, particularly because things are changing. The macroeconomics are changing. The different, the, the, the way business is done in the world is changing. The global value chains are changing, you know, completely. Now, the leader, leadership has to respond with new strategies. Now, when you come up with new strategy, you also need to come up with a structure to say, do I have the structure that will be able to deliver on this strategy? That's leadership. And then if the multinationals do it, that's actually their secret, okay? Dynamic restructuring. The second level is opportunity, market opportunity. And then part of it is looking at, is the business model that we operated before 2020 still working today? How can you be operating the same business model and then expect to grow when the entire context has actually changed? All right, then I have something I call challenge-driven goal. I'll talk about it a little bit. Then the other level is sales, all right? Because um, at the end of it, if you're not selling, the business is not growing. It doesn't matter, you know, how big an organization is. If you're not really, really selling, you're not, you're not optimizing sales so that the cash flow is, is, is healthy, um, so that you continue to serve the customers and then they continue to come to you for repeat business, then you are not going to survive, you know, the difficult times. So let's talk about leadership just a little bit. Now, how many of us saw what happened um, in Qatar? Um, I just saw the video. How many of us saw the viral video of these Japanese fans? Okay. Uh, this is from New York Times. Cheer, chant, clean. <laughs> Japan takes out the tr thrash, the trash, and others get the hint. All right. So... It was interesting. I found that later because I didn't watch it. It was interesting that these people actually lost the match. I think it was to, uh, I don't remember, one of these East European countries, okay? They lost the match. 
So they were cheering their people, but then they lost that particular match. And then as they were going, they all turned around, you know, just brought out these bags and then started picking trash. And they were not doing it for the camera or anything. Now, and then their coach said, because people were like, wow. But the people were like, for Japanese people, this is just a normal thing to do. When you leave a place, you have to leave it cleaner than it was before. Now, why did I bring this up? How would you like to build a business where your employees know the right thing to do at the right time and they do it even though you are not there to tell them to do it? How would you like to have a business like that? And then when businesses complain about you know, people issues, it usually revolves around this because if you have to overmanage as a CEO, if you have to always look over the shoulders of people before they can do the right thing, that business is going to be very, very overwhelming. So one of the, one of the strategic goals um, I would encourage most of the businesses here to pursue um, in the coming year, especially because the Jackpot phenomenon has, has introduced a new level of talent challenges you know, for many Nigerian businesses is to think about um, developing your culture. There is a way to do culture. And I think that when we have a leadership retreat next, um, next in January, I'm going to be sharing some things. So how do you actually develop a culture, develop a company where people do the right thing, whether you are there or not? Uh, please give us, give us time on the previous slide. Let's see, the one with pyramid. Yes. Okay. Yes. That's, that's the one with pyramid. Give us time. Yeah. You want uh, to go through this short for us, please? Okay, so let me go through this uh, again. I actually talked through them. I didn't know it was not showing. So because this is the this is the core of what we are doing tonight. The core of the how do you rebuild value? How do you restructure in the face of the challenging economic times? And this is particularly important because we've been hearing people like. Um, the Amazon founder and um, Elon Musk today, today or yesterday, uh, so they've been screaming about the coming recession. Elon Musk told um, the American Fed to lower interest rate today, otherwise uh, the world was going to slip into a terrible recession. Uh, Jeff Bezos came out, also said, if you have money, keep cash, don't buy capital uh, equipment and things like that, you know, because recession is coming. Okay, so that's their own prediction and things like that. And it to be true for you, I mean, if you buy it. But I think um, generally the world is probably heading into some more challenging economic um, uh, 2023 and beyond. Therefore, how do you, as a business, position yourself for profitability, position yourself above these things? Because you saw how these other companies have lasted for a thousand years because of this same thing, this same thing you're seeing on the slide here. So they focus on adaptive leadership. They always pursued opportunity. They followed opportunity as the, you know as things were changing, and then they were actually sales focused. You know they were focused on serving the customer. The game of business is the same century after century. The players and field may change, the seasons might change, but the game remains exactly the same. Soccer is soccer, whether it's being played in that village field with children on barefoot, you know who don't have, uh, who are not wearing Adidas or Nike shoes, or it's being played in your secondary school or it's being played in the streets um, of Lagos or of your village or it's being played in the European Championship or it's being played in Qatar. The game is the same. The game of business is the same. Business, business, the way business prospered 1,440 years ago is exactly the way it will prosper today. Uh, the ent entire thing about business model has three things. The way your company creates, delivers, and captures value. That game does not change. 
the context might be different because you have different products, different sectors, but it's the same thing. So whether it is services or it is products, whether you are in retail or you are in wholesale, it's exactly the same game. So it's very, very important to know that. So uh, let me share some few hacks on envisioning the future as we do environmental scanning to see the way things are in the world today. And then we begin to think about how do we step into 2023? How do we step into 2023 powerfully? So the first is that you need to take a look at your lens of the future, all right? Are you going to live out of your memory or you're going to live out of your imagination? Um, so the problem with living out of your memory is that your brain is basically a memory bank. It has stored all your experiences of the past, you know, the emotions, the e feelings and all that, you know, so it stored it here, it's a memory bank. And so if you keep looking to the memories of how you run the business in 2020, in 2015 and things like that, and then how you failed particularly, how sales were bad, you know, how managing the people were very, very difficult, how the Nigerian economy has not been very, very uh, healthy for businesses, you know, so you have memory of all that. And then you are allowing it to affect the way you're looking at the future. Then it's gonna be a very big challenge. It's gonna be a very big challenge. So you wanna you want change the lens with which you're looking at the future to make sure that you are not giving energy to the past that should be given to the future of the business. The other thing is Einstein had said that you cannot solve a problem at the same level of consciousness that created them. So there is a consciousness in the whole world right now about the challenges in businesses and then all those obstacles you mentioned at the beginning. And therefore, you know, for you to solve these problems, you have to ascend to a higher level of consciousness, a higher dimension to be able to deal with the problems of business that you're going to face in 2023 and beyond because you cannot solve a problem at the same level of consciousness that created this. How does that show up in practical terms? You know, um, I just finished working with a client a few days ago. Before that time, it was another client. And then as I was finishing, another client, you know, was saying I should do something for them tomorrow. And then from Monday next week, another client. And I'm like, you know, just telling the people that many people in my space are complaining that they don't have business. But I've actually had to reject businesses within this time. Like the one I'm supposed to have had tomorrow, I rejected it. I started this abundance challenge a couple of months ago, a low ticket thing that I was doing for people. I couldn't sustain it because we don't have the bandwidth to do all the consulting, the coaching, the retreat facilitations and all the things happening. So here I am, people are there saying, oh, they're not getting projects. They are not, people are not paying for their high ticket. And then you find somebody else operating on a different dimension, a different state of consciousness, actually having bandwidth issues, serious bandwidth issues, serious, like serious bandwidth issues. Before I came in into this call, another client says, okay, I want you to do this for us and things like that. And there's no way I do not have the time you know, for that. In this same economy. So you see a lot of the consciousness you carry around you would either be repelling projects, repelling business or attracting a lot of it. So you, why is it that in the same economy that people are suffering and complaining about that some people have too much business and other people don't get business is because of that fact. The third thing is the way you envision uh, the future, you imbue it with bias and error. So you are projecting the current limitations into your future. So now, because your company has never made um, uh, $500,000 in revenue, uh, $100,000 in revenue, or $1 million in revenue, you've never made it in the past. 
Therefore, you are projecting in the future. And then especially now, um, five years ago, $1 million would have been an equivalent of, say, $300 million Naira. Now, the $1 million is $800 million. The same, 100, the same $1 million is $800 million. You are projecting the future. Ah, we cannot make, we made the $200 million. We almost made $1 million. Like when it was $300 million Naira, it was $200. Now, if you are making the same $200 million, that's even going to be like, uh, um, you know, less than $100,000 or something like that. So you're projecting the errors and the mistakes and the failures of the past into the future. Don't do that. That you haven't made it when things were good does not mean that you cannot even make 10 times that when things are rough. Okay, do, you, do you get this point? It's really important. So when you're thinking about the future, don't limit the future. Don't, don't uh, sabotage the future because of the limitations and the mistakes of the past because things can change like that transformation happens like that some of you here have done some transformation work with you you know that transformation is not just you know increment of 30 percent 40 percent 50 percent transformation is going from just where you are right now to 200 times to 10x to 150x and that's the kind of thinking that we need to think in challenging times okay then i've already mentioned that it's much easier to create the future than to predict it. Okay. Now, the other part of leadership is the 80-20 leadership, what I call the 80-20 leadership. So you want to look at where you are right now in your company, the, all the activities that you're doing to really ask yourself what we are doing in the company right now. Should we actually be doing them? That it, you've been doing it for the, since the past three, four years and it's been working, does not mean that you continue to do it right now. So, so what I call the 80-20 leadership, the Pareto leadership, 20% of your customers generate 80% of your revenues. 20% of customers are responsible for 80% of the complaints and the problems you have in your business. 80% of your resource in your business comes from only 20% of your activities. And 20% of your employees are responsible for 80% of your business results. So you need to identify these 20% and these 80% and then uh, configure your leadership to the reality of what you're seeing here. Otherwise, you find yourself pouring resources where you should be removing resources and then starving other aspects of your business from resources that they should be. So many of us, even from doing this alone, without changing anything else you're doing in your business, just doing this alone can even before this year ends, add some significant revenue to your bottom line. Okay, so let's talk about opportunity. Um, so you have to answer the question, do we have the market opportunity in the new environment, in the new world of business? Do we really have the market opportunity to support scale? Because the market that you had four years ago may not actually be there today, all right? The markets have shifted. And are you still working on the same market that is no longer an opportunity? Then the other question to ask, a very important question is right now where you are, where does cash come from in your business? You really need to know where the cash is coming from. All right, so opportunity is critical in very, very tough times you do not have you do not have the 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 luxury to start pouring resources into opportunities that are not you know really high level opportunities you really need to be very very opportunity focused all right some of you are already familiar with um, my um story uh but many businesses are working hard on suboptimal opportunity so the worst thing you want to do right now as a business strategy you know, in your business is to work on some, to work so hard, an opportunity that you can see is not delivering anything. If the market is, if the market is not there, stop wasting time. You know, so when times are much better and then you, afford, you have um, a lot of, uh, you know, house money to burn, then you can, 
you can put money into any kind of opportunity. But right now, you really need to go for opportunity that works, not suboptimal ones. You see, like what happened to me when I started off, um, you know, and I started running very low ticket offers, $13 as of that time, about $10. And then um, I was on television, I was on radio. Even though I advertised on television, I advertised on radio. I was never able to fill a class with up to 10 people. Millions of people were listening to me every day, 5 million people, maybe 10 million people every week on television. And then when I advertised workshops for five years, I was never able to feel that. So the, the, opportunity, so the picture you see right there uh, was uh, one of those workshops I advertised on television. Um, I advertised it for months. I talked about it for months. And that place, that venue you're seeing there, uh, that's me there in an empty room, was a uh, Unilag, um, Unilag uh, conference center facility, guest house or something facility. Nobody came. Nobody came. Wrong market. Then Portaco people said, I should come and do the same thing for them. Then you see exactly the same experience. I spent about half a million naira at that time work, doing this, um, this event in Port Harcourt. Okay, It was advertised on TV. It was advertised on flyers everywhere. I sent people to Bayelsa, sent people to Aha, sent people to Port Harcourt. They shared flyers. On that day, I was in that room alone, as alone for the rest of the day. So now, what I now decided was, okay, let me leave poor people because I decided I would never do business for, for poor people. Because when I came out, I was trying to save poor people. I was trying to save everybody. That's why I was running seminars for 3,000 naira, 5,000 naira, thinking, okay, since I'm on television, 10 million people watch me, uh, that even if I did 3,000 naira, that at least 5,000 people, 10,000 people will come and I was going to be rich. It did not happen. The opportunity was not there. So when I came back from Portaco, the very next program I did, I made it 69,000 Naira, and I moved it from all those uh, mainland uh, cheap places straight to Protea Hotel. It was a brand new, almost a new hotel at that time in Ikoi. Nine people signed up. Some of those nine people are still clients up to today. One of them, I, I served them. I still work. This was 2009. 2009, 2010. One of them still, I've been working with him. I still do something for his organization. Uh, February this year, nine people without TV, without too much effort and all that came. That was now how I found the opportunity. So you really need to know what the opportunity is. And then since that time, I have never looked back. Okay. So since that time, I have served some really, I'm continuing to serve some really, really phenomenal um, clients. So these people, I work with them. And so they are not these three, 3,000 Naira, 5,000 5, Naira people, but in a year, I work with these five, five clients, 12 clients from like this, and, you know, and it's, and it's great. So you need to find your opportunity, all right? Okay, a uh, challenge-driven goal is um, challenge-driven growth. Is where like the... The challenge that I ran last month, I think it ended early this... Um, it ended early this month in November. So we said, um, I worked with um, a group of, is it six or seven entrepreneurs and then the challenge was how can we make our annual revenue in one month that's an example of a challenge driven we grow through challenges we grow through obstacles and then in the process of doing something that's almost really really difficult that will break it you learn a lot in the process okay and uh, what happens when you hit a metal it expands so when we are facing some economic heat, that's not the time to that's not the time to shrink. That's the time to actually expand. And so finally, let's talk about sales. Let's talk about sales. All right. Uh, there's a Haitian proverb that every prayer ends with 
Amen. And that is the way sales really are. In fact, I asked you um, earlier on that what superpower, if you had it, would generate 1 million for your business in the next 90 days? Many of you answered different things. But I believe that selling, the selling is the superpower. Selling is a superpower. Every money that will come into your bank account is as a result of that activity of selling. And so selling is under is underrated, all right? Because if you look at the other income part of your financial statement, it's usually like 0, 0.0 something, you know, interest and all that, 0, 0.0 something percent of that. But majority, the only source of revenue is selling. Now, this is a model for optimizing your sales. And this is, this is a model, this is a formula, this is the game of business summarized for sales to happen, or if you're, if you're not having sales, the way you should in your organization, it has something to do with either of these four pillars. All right, so you need to, to, to start um, diagnosing um, do you have the ideal client? Are you serving the ideal client? Do you have an offer that is the best in the marketplace that the customers can say no to? Do you have clear sales messaging that connects the ideal client to the offer? And do you have a reliable traffic source where you can always go and uh, source the ideal client and then that cycle comes. This is everything you need to know about sales and marketing. This is everything you need to know to optimize your sales. Whether you are in real estate or you are in retail or you are in B2B or you are in service, whatever you are in, this is the game of business that you're seeing in one slide. Okay. Um, so, and the final question, all right, that I would like you to reflect on in your business is what barriers are keeping customers from doing business with you right now? So everybody type in the chat. I would like all of us to participate in this. I want you to think the barriers keeping customers from doing business with you right now. Go for it. <clears throat> what are the barriers keeping customers from doing business with you? Okay. I'm waiting for the chat. Because we have to know the barriers to solve them, okay? Cost of the items, all right? Mm -hmm. Against what other people around you are selling, okay? Not making enough offers. Delivery. Wrong messaging and targeting, absolutely. So I think that solves the challenge you were talking about um, because one thing is to have offers because the, but the other thing is to have an offer mismatch. Because if you have an offer that's supposed to be for high ticket, um, high ticket clients and is attracting low ticket people, then it means that something is not aligned about that offer. That offer is not matching your ideal client, okay? Right value proposition. Okay, very good. Um, okay, so as we come toward the end, um, I would like to tell you about the leaders retreat that we have in 2023. Um, this is a time that Several CEOs meet with me. We've been running leaders retreat since, I believe it's since 2015. And we, 2015 or 2014, and then we usually have it one, the very first Saturday of every year, because we think that that's a good time for business leaders and leaders to come together and then um, develop some power thoughts and then ideas toward the future. So we have some, We've had some really incredible times. Uh, this year alone, these were uh, my clients for this year. All right, the people I worked with this year. And um, now working with these clients, working with um, businesses like this one-on-one, -on -one, 
can be very, very involving because we typically do $5,000 a day. I know when we started $5,000 a day, the Naira was like 315 Naira today. So now 5,000, you know, is the same amount of money uh, when we do our leadership retreat, you know, with these organizations, you know, but right now is a lot of money um, when you multiply it by 800 Naira and things like that. But that's typically what we do. And then we have worked with um, these businesses this year. Uh, we worked twice with MTN, worked twice with Florida Wave, um, one in Zanzibar and the other time in Accra. Um, worked once with Nuts and Cakes. We're currently working with the Nigerian Content Development and Monitoring Board. Okay, so um, what we do, what we do in the Leaders Retreat is a kind of condensed version of what I do with these organizations, all right? But now we do it, I do it as a group program because when you come to it as um, individual CEOs, it is, it is much more affordable for you than to have me come to your company. And um, then you have to, it's very, very worthwhile because now it's, it's just focused on your company and all that, but this gives you an opportunity to have the same benefits that these people have. Some of them you're seeing here, um, I help them to develop their mission statements that have helped them to, you know, some of them you are seeing here, I also help them to develop their culture and I'm helping them develop their culture, developing their culture documents, doing what we call a nomination, taking the values of the organization and norming it. So for many of you, um, maybe you don't know that these are the things I quietly do because you see me making too much noise on social media all the time. So some people think I don't have work. Many times I am doing a lot of consulting and coaching work for these organizations. So I'm offering you exactly that same opportunity um, in um, 2023 during our leaders retreat. So I would like everyone to please take um, note of the date, which is going to be 14th of January. Of uh, 14th of January is a Saturday, and it's going to be the whole day. Um, so let me show you a few. So hopefully this will also show. Um, let me show you a few. What I now call photo, photo, photo for to testimonials, <laughs> for testimonials. Um, do you see the screen? Do you see this? Yes, we do. All right, okay. So these are just a few of the, this, this just gives you a feel of these activities. You know, when I do hold my work with some of these organizations, some of you might actually see yourselves, so your company here. So these are some of the in-company retreats. Um, these are some of the, this is LK and Associates, you know, these guys are into energy, um, they're competitors of Sahara Energy, um, yeah, so these are some of the activities, okay, some of the activities and some of the retreats, you know, that we do with the company, this one was uh, with Kutix PLC, extremely, extremely intense, Okay, this was uh, a retreat for brand life. So we have thousands of these events. This was a design thinking, um, a design thinking uh, project with um, some women business owners. Okay, um, so usually that leaders retreat is a great, great opportunity for you to re-examine your. Um, for you to re-examine the way you do your business. So now um, the date is 
14th of January. And please mark it in your calendar. That's a place to be. And we are going to have it in Victoria Island, but there's also going to be streaming because now we have a streaming technology for those who are not going to be physically present in Lagos. Um, last, you know, this January, we, we, had, we had it virtually. And then we had some people joining us from Ghana. And then we had a company joining us from, um, well, what was this place? This Portuguese speaking, Angola, from Angola. Angola. Yeah, and then eventually the Angola company um, hired us to do um, to do a full retreat, you know, with their with their, with all their staff. All right. So the theme for 2023 is fearless leadership. All right. We chart a strategic path for 2023. Uh, gain the clarity and confidence, you know, to face the uncertainties that are coming in 2023. Whether you are in retail or you're in B2B, or you are in manufacturing, or you are in whatever sector, you need to be really, really ready for it. And then what we're going to do this year, something very different, you know, this year, is to actually have, um, you know, specific coaching sessions like hot seats, you know, where you can come with some specific business or personal challenges, and then we can walk you through that. So it's going to happen at Protea by Marriott in Kirama Waters. That's where I'm currently doing some work with NCDMB. And um, they, have, they have a very, very beautiful facility there. The participation is 167,300 Naira. But my birthday is actually coming up on, what's today? On Friday, <laughs> 2nd December. <laughs> All righty. So uh, that's my one way of one way of celebrating um, you celebrating my birthday with me. So there's an offer for one twenty seven three hundred, which will end on that second December once I finish eating my cake. But for today, if you are going to sign up for the leaders retreat for twenty twenty three. You are going, I'm even doing something much more crazy for just this night and today only. While we are talking and taking questions and answers, you are going to do only 110,000. Many of you who are in the chat who have been through uh, this with me, um, you know that we don't play. This is not a marketing gimmick. When I say it's only available for tonight, it's only available for tonight. Um, and then tomorrow, it will revert to 127 until after my birthday then it will go to the full 167,300. And usually we don't care, you know, how many people, you know, come. So even if it's one or two people, we give, we, 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 we enjoy ourselves and then just give you the best. So um, if you'd like to take advantage of that, you know, right now, um, this is the, so while we are doing question and answers, we can go ahead and, um, you know, just sign up, you know, just make, make your payment. And then, um, then send uh, your full details, you know, to um, to to Williams in the chat, um, and then you know we set you up. Now, there are a lot of things that come with this leadership retreat. We have uh, the last leadership hackathon, sorry, revenue hackathon, which we did in April. People paid two hundred thousand dollars for that. When you, when you, once you pay for this, we'll give you access to that uh, revenue hackathon. You know, we haven't done that before. So you begin to see um, and go through the exercises, you get the materials, you get the slides of everything that we use to help people to work on their revenue if you do that tonight. So while I leave this here, um, I'm open to take questions for the things that we have done tonight, you know, while you do this. So we just have another, um, 10 minutes of question and answers on anything that we have shared today. And I'll leave this here so you can take advantage of that and do it tonight. And, uh, but I'll leave, um, I'll leave this on while you ask your questions, if you have any questions on anything that we have covered tonight. So if you have a question, you can unmute, you can unmute and ask. Yes, Langry. Thank you so much, uh, Obo. I met you on LinkedIn because I'm an uh, exercise 
and fitness enthusiasts. Whoa. And that's where you know I've not, I've not I don't think I've missed any of your work. Amazing. So, I just came back from work too. That's why I did. Wow, amazing. So, nice so now, time. yeah. Thank you. I have also really wished part of the, uh, the seminar workshop you had. One of my desire to be one of them. In fact, I was one. I told my wife it was a target, but yeah. I think we couldn't meet it financially. But it's still a target, and I'm sure we meet it <laughs> now. Absolutely. Yeah. In this in this economy. Why mm. people are crying, they are lamenting, no sales, no income. The future looks very bleak. You are turning down business. That implies, the implication is huge. Because if you don't have more than enough, you will not turn down. Mm. And while we're going through all the, all, all the a fantastic record, 1,000 years, now years of establishment. There's something I want to ask you. Mm -hmm. Environment, does it environment as a, a factor, an impact? Because when we were supplying our challenges, you said something, all these are within your control. And I noticed nobody actually talked about what is outside our control. <laughs> so while we're looking at, okay, fine, the environment, the operating environment, but if I look at your own example, it's like it's already answered my question, but I still want you to address. Mm -hmm. Oh, did we lose you? Oh, no. <laughs> no, you didn't lose me. Can you hear me? Yeah, I finished. Oh, okay. okay. Oh, you finished? Yeah, I said, do my question. My question, yeah. if I look at you, it's like yeah. you have answer to that question. Okay. But that notwithstanding, I still want you to address that issue of what impact does environment has on all these we are talking about? Yeah. Okay, good question. And um, while we are talking, uh, somebody has registered. That is, okay. Okay, Sam has registered for Grocery Bazaar. Thank you very much, Sam. Um, so, Williams, please take note of that. Um, okay. Um, so, that's a good question. The environment does matter now because if you look around the world, the, the distribution of uh, millionaires around the world, if you look at the distribution of millionaires around the world, um, and then the billionaires, and then the unicorns around the world, you find that the millionaires around the world are kind of concentrated in certain blocks, like in the United States, uh, in China, places like Israel, and many parts of Europe. And so it is clearly easier looks easier to make a million dollars, for instance, in the United States than it is to make in Nigeria or Ghana or Sudan or Kenya and these places. So it's, it's true that environment matters. Now, but environment matters to the degree that you do not have the skills to be able to overcome in that environment. In other words, the problem is not so much this, the environment. The environmental conditions are there. Some environments are more challenging for business and more toxic for business than others. But it only matters to the degree that you have the muscles and the competencies to be able to solve the problems of that environment. And I give you an example. A couple of years ago, there were some, um, it was a venture, a venture capitalist that um, wanted to find businesses to fund in Nigeria. And this is even to you people who are thinking about funding. Funding is not a problem. Funding, I know that funding has reduced a little bit in Africa. I was looking at the data 
the VC funding reduced a little bit, you know, um, this year from what it was last year and the two years before. But there's a lot of money. There's a lot of money pursuing ideas. That's going to be a different when we have a different session, maybe another di business dinner could be like the next month's own. We can talk about funding, but having been in this space and played in this space for this number of years, the funding is not as a problem. It's not so much a problem as people think. The problem is actually structuring our ideas, structuring our businesses to be able to attract the funding. Okay, so we might have some very, very good business ideas, but we haven't structured it in such a way that VCs are attracted to them, to us. So I mentioned that because these two gentlemen now came, we met in Victoria Island. We met over a coffee uh, bar in Victoria Island. And they were asking me, okay, oh boy, that would, my work in Stan, would stand for seed and then with Seeds and Lagos Business School that they recommended me for uh, a meeting if i could possibly point them to businesses that they could put money they had tens of hundreds of millions of dollars and they were looking for businesses and the time i met with them the time we had that meeting was at the height of all these boko haram attacks the nyanya attack and all this and whatever and the news all over the world about the terrorism and all these things going on in nigeria about you know the Fulani herdsmen who were going around the whole place slaughtering villages and all that. That was the time this people came and we we're having that meeting. So when I finished listening to them, the first question I asked them, I said, okay, yeah, that I have some good businesses I can actually point you to. But that I'm curious. I said, first question, have you been reading everything that's going on in Nigeria? I'm very curious with all this terrorism, with all this political instability, with all this economic, you know, with all this news about corruption and all that and all that and all that, aren't you concerned? You, so they said they'd be hearing all this. I said, and you want to bring in money into Nigeria? Then both of them looked at each other and chuckled. They said, Obo, <laughs> that Nigeria is nothing compared to where they have invested. That they, they, they did some huge investments in the Philippines at that particular time that they were here. And, and at that time in the Philippines, there was a time that I think they had the president. They were telling me, you know, who, whether he was trying to crack down on political dissidents or some drug people and all that, he was destroying modern people up and down. That was the time that they went in and made their biggest investment up to that moment in the Philippines. So it's not about the how bad things are bad, you know, in some things are worse in other in some places, the ease of doing business is, is uh, better in some places than in others. But it's only challenging us because man conquered all the very, very harsh places in the in the world. Man conquered the desert, you know, much of where Israel is right now, you know, you know, was desert. Um, they conquered that place. Man conquered the, uh, the uh, coldest regions in Canada, in different places. They are living there, thriving there. So we can conquer these things. So yes, environment actually matters. But what instead of asking for um, an easier environment, we should be asking, we should be trying to develop ourselves, you know, with the skills to be able to master that environment. Because if we do, like everybody is running away, so those who will stay and actually conquer this environment, they will do extremely well. So I think it's a long answer to you know, that short question, but I think I deliberately expounded on it because I know what a lot of people think. And of course I experienced it myself, you know, the challenges you know, here of doing business here, the multiple taxation, the police harassment, the horrors of the cost, Nigerian customs, if you are trying to bring things. I, had a, I have a client who um, brought in milk. He, he ordered milk you know, from Europe for his, um, for his business, worth 150,000 euros at that time. While the milk was still there, the federal government said, no more importation of milk, that only six companies and I think all six of them, none of them was Nigerian. Or maybe say one of them Nigerian companies, the other ones Lebanese and things like that. Only six were granted license to import milk into Nigeria. 
and then everybody else has to go to buy from them. I've had clients, you know, who have things at the port for three months, for four months. They can't clear that because of the Nigerian uh, situation. It is horrible. It really is horrible. But that's why we do the sort of things that we do. That's why we need these masterminds. That's why we need these kind of things, you know, to actually not only inspire each other, but to find out how are people dealing with these situations. Like in one of the masterminds, somebody was telling me, one of the CEOs was saying, talking about how he's surviving this currency devaluation thing. It's amazing. The guy is doing extremely well. He's doing extremely well. He shared his strategy, what he's doing. So why some other people who don't know are there crying, oh, the Naira, the Naira. Some guy has found a very smart way. He's in, he's in IT. He's found a very, very smart way by going into something that's completely outside of IT, you know, to hedge these currency challenges. So don't look at them. The environment does affect to the degree that the entrepreneur decide, because you see, our calling as entrepreneurs is to solve problems. Is to solve problems, not to run away from them. And if you look at all the big businesses, the big businesses, billionaires in the world, they became billionaires by solving problems that other people ran away from. Whether you're talking about Elon Musk, you're talking about the Amazon guy, Jeff Bezos, or you're talking about Bill Gates, they all made money by doing the things other people were running away from, solving problems that other people aren't solving. I hope that helps. Yeah, thank, thank you very you. much. When I said it that your person answered the question, I just wanted to expand on it. And I want to thank you for coming up with this idea for us. It's very much appreciated. I want to tell Uche, thank you for being. Thank you. Two more, two more registrations. So we have three registrations. Okay, do we have any more questions before we round? Any more? I can take one or more questions. And for these registrations, please, um, you can send the, your details, your name and all that. You can do that in the same group chat so that we can give you access to the Revenue Hackathon videos. All right, any more question, anybody? Just raise your hand and then we can take that. Okay, Charles. Good evening, Numo. Um, good to be here. Yeah. My question really is, for you in the business world, you know, you took a, a, a huge leap. Now, over the years, you have done this repeatedly. Statistically, where would you say your most significant clients have come from? Referrals, marketing, or where specifically? Okay, that's a very good question. Um, I would believe it's a combination of all those. Um, I, I believe it's a combination of all those. And I would say that perhaps it has come mostly from um, my content marketing. Um, it's come mostly from, I think I would say that 80% of this has actually come from my content marketing. Um, it was my content marketing that got me into LBS, all right, as an adjunct faculty. And then when I started teaching in LBS, it gave me a very wide exposure to the, to the businesses because, of course, like you know, in LBS, you know, people who are who to who, I'm sorry, who is who in business in Nigeria, you know, come to... Uh, Lagos Business School. So I've been able to generate um, some clients because people listen to me in the classroom uh, when I teach, say they, they, they have this advanced management program. I also teach in the MBA and I teach marketing. So many of them listen to me and then they ask me to come to work with them as an organization. That was how I got into Kutix because somebody from Kutix was in my class um, at LBS. That was also how I got uh, another client, you know, Chikasin Group, you know. Um, it was through my affiliation with LBS. Then 
um, the things I've been publishing on LinkedIn and then my WhatsApp status. So I think in my line of work, what has really helped me a lot in generating these clients is a combination. It's like the content drove it and then from there, the referrals. And so I've had a couple of referrals, like when I worked for, uh, for multi-choice was a referral. When I finished working with multi-choice, somebody in multi-choice referred me to MTN. I started working with MTN from a referral. And then it's somebody in MTN that now gave referral to IBTC. And I worked with IBTC. So there have been a couple of referrals. But I think, you know, what's been very strategic is the value you deliver is what makes people want to, you know, refer you. And that's what makes people, you know, when you have a repeat business, when you have customers who come to you, clients, especially these B2B clients, you know, who come to you again and again, people you've done something for. And, um, you know, they come back. And this is, we're not talking about little money. Like I said, you know, what we do a day, typically like $5,000. So if you're working for two days, um, that's, that's 10,000. But, but there's one client it, we did three days for. Um, we had a retreat with them at um, um, VGC, but because they had a startup, you know, we charge ten thousand dollars, and they paid in dollars. We have a way you pay in dollars, and then we have a way you pay in naira, whichever one. So that's really the answer. I think you really want to, if if you are my kind of space, you really want to put your content out there. People read it. People read these things. I'm amazed, you know, people read it, even when they don't comment. And sometimes the clients that have engaged with me were clients who read what I wrote, but they were not, they, they didn't like, and they didn't comment, you know, on it. But they reached, and then people, so I meet people at the airport, I meet people, I met people in Ghana, you know, oh. uh, months ago. And then they, they stopped me, they say, one of them was recounting, Oh, you did what you uh, wrote. He said, he said, everybody in the office reads me. He came with his chief operating officer that day. And then he was mentioning things I've said in the video and done that I had completely forgotten. Now those guys, they're in real estate in Ghana. They are planning to bring me over to Ghana, you know, to work with them. So it's content because people need to know what you're made of. And then when you now go... People also need to, you know, you need to deliver value. You need to deliver like 10 times what people pay. So that has been like my own strategy. So if I come to work for you and you're paying me 10,000, you're paying me 5 million naira, or you're paying me 6 million naira, I must, as a matter of principle, deliver at least 60 or 100 million, you know, for you tangibly. So we worked with a client last year, uh, last week. <clears throat> they were... They came in with a 5 billion Naira plan. But by the time they left that place, I made sure that it was expanded to 15 billion. And then they, they now see 15 billion. So it makes it very easy for them to pay. And then for them to ask me to come back, because people asking you to come back is a validation. So if you don't deliver in the first, they won't ask you to come back. Does that help? Yes, it does. Okay. All right. Thank okay. Let's take, let's let's take one more and the last one, and then we can round off. Any more? Just raise your hand. My my hand is actually up. Oh, okay. Taufi, go for yes. it. Okay. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much, Obo. Um, yeah. some of us are not new to your classes, and uh, it sounded like. As if uh, some of us are back in Stanford. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so yeah. my question is um, around business continuity. Mm -hmm. um, you, you cited examples of businesses that have stayed for over a thousand years, and the fact that they've actually passed through a lot. Um, and I know that um, when we reviewed that video in Stanford, uh, seed, 
we actually saw different businesses that have actually stayed for different numbers of years, 200 years, 250, 500, and all of that. Uh, so coming back to this part of the world, uh, I would like to link it to the environment. Uh, the kind of environment we have to operate in Africa now, um, I'm not sure what the oldest company in Africa is, but obviously as, as an entrepreneur, if we are going to make um, a big uh, leap, obviously we have to be thinking of businesses that will outlive um, all of us as much as possible. Mm -hmm. So I want to ask you uh, clearly, I know for people doing consulting, uh, it's probably going to be a bit difficult for them to say they have a conducting business, business that, that would um, outlive them or that would stay for a certain number of years. Yeah. Uh, that, that's individual consulting anyway, like what you're doing. So, but looking at um, businesses that, that a lot of us listening to you are doing and uh, those you have consulted for, uh, what are the kind of advice that you want to give us for us to begin to look into the direction of um, the businesses actually outliving all of us and staying and then um, continue to generate value for the African space as much as possible. Thank you. All right. Um, so in my own case, uh, in, in terms of consulting, I think it's usually those things are driven by mission. Um, so even in my own case, my goal is also to build something that will be there hundreds of years after I have gone. Um, and then I've sat down to brainstorm uh, possibly how that can happen. You know, um, I started with consulting and coaching. And that is unlikely what I'm going to pass on you know, to the family is unlikely. Because if you remember, Samsung started their business uh, with noodles. But today, Samsung is not doing noodles. Yeah, but the principle is the same. So for the businesses I work with, you know, some of them I'm helping to develop their culture document because the single secret of building a business that would outlast you is culture. And um, part of that culture is character because character flaw, the things that people are doing that are unethical and getting away with it won't last more than one generation. So if you look at many of the businesses that um, have also died in Nigeria, they, there wasn't ethical leadership. So, and even though these multinationals, you know, people, um, people suspect them, you know, when you are in Shell, for instance, as we, as you join Shell, I don't know whether they still do it, but the first set of documents they give you, there's one they call um, Shell General something, something principles. Um, if you join Chevron, they also give you a document they call Chevron Way. That little document encapsulates their culture. They take the culture very, very seriously. When I joined Shell, it took um, 18 months to recruit me. And then a couple of people who joined different departments at that time. It used to be a hell of a long process, you know, to get into Shell. Upwards of two years, sometimes more than two years. Now, um, and then NAPIMS, I think it's NAPIMS they call them then, would always have to give approval before Shell could recruit to anybody. So sometimes this approval is not given within five years. Therefore, it means that if they recruit one person, they really did like this, you know, to recruit that person. And um, you wouldn't want to just lose that individual anyhow. But one guy I still remember came with us and he was uh, employed, I believe it was in finance or accounting, one of those finance. Then this guy did one small, very tiny, tiny, tiny fraud. There was nothing that they did not do to say, Shell just terminated him immediately. We just came home. 
he they terminated him, even though they went through that grueling process to sort him out from thousands of people who applied. Shell killed that guy, just you know, fired him. People begged, people from high, people from government politicians, you know. So one thing is establish ethical leadership. Ethical leadership. Ethical leadership is number one. Number one. Don't do wrong, no matter how tempting, no matter how much you know it's bringing, all that everybody is doing it. But you know, always let your standard be higher than even a higher standard. So that's one. Number two is um, develop a culture document and then transist. You know, you are the CEO. Transist from becoming from a, a CEO to a CCO. I think I shared that with your company when I was working with you. So from a chief executive officer to a chief culture officer, 80% of your task will be in communicating the vision and the culture of the company, like on a daily, daily basis, it's routine. All you continue to do is culture. Because the point I was making with the Japanese soccer fans was that this thing had gotten imbued in them. And the government of Japan, the Minister of Environment, the president of Japan didn't need to be there to instruct them. It was already part of their DNA. So your challenge is how do you how do you inject that culture into the DNA of everybody that is coming to the organization? That's number two. Um, number three is developing a culture that gives people ownership, where people come in and then they can see their vision. The, the developing a, a culture in your business has got a shared vision because ultimately they, we're talking about people. And if people see, if they have a stick in the business, if they see themselves as part of it, if they see their future there, if they see your company as a place that if they come, their own personal needs will be met forever. They will stay. So how do you build that kind of business that gives ownership and empowers to, um, if you look at motivation 2.0 or motivation 3.0, people are looking for where they can gain mastery, where they can, where, where they can accomplish purpose, and then um, where they can have autonomy. So a combination of that, but you know, so would definitely help. But the chief thing is working around culture, and that there are ways to do it. So hopefully, sometime next year we might be able to because it's a, it's a big question I've been I've been hearing from different places, especially because we've seen the work ethic of Nigeria. I've seen the work ethic of Nigeria change drastically from what it was in the 1970s to what it is now. And then when I go to some parts of West Africa, some parts of Africa, I still see that that work ethic is preserved. But right? because in the seventies, people will tell you the truth. In the seventies, people will, um, you know, if you dropped your wallet filled with a thousand dollars by the street, you will get it back. You know, nobody will touch it. You'll go back, go and come back, and then find it. You know. Uh, but today, it's no longer like that. The people are so pleasure focused. The people don't want to work hard, but they want to earn big money and things like that. So you really want to make sure that your culture is strong enough to attract just the right kind of people with the right kind of behaviors and routines and practices you want to see in your organization. So your recruitment, that's probably number four. Your recruitment must be extremely different. You know, your recruitment must be extremely different. Just you really have to come up with innovative ways to bring in people because bringing in is harder to take them out after you brought them in than to keep them from coming in. And if your culture is going to be diluted, if it's going to be poisoned, it's going to happen from the point of recruitment. So that means you have to do serious strategic recruiting and not just recruiting anyhow. So that's what I think, you know, if you just are mindful of those four things, you know, you can begin to develop that muscle ahead of time. And of course, succession comes in naturally because you have to be thinking about exit. 
And um, so, so the last question I will add, leave with you to, in that regard is just ask yourself, if I'm building a 500 year old, year old company, what do I need to do today? in order for this company to be 500 years old. So you just keep that in mind as you do everything you do. And then every day you say, a company that will last 500 years, would they behave like this? Would they do this activity? Would they act like this? Uh, what kind of people would they bring in? Would this kind of person work in it if this company will last for 400, 500, 600 years? Yeah, I'll put something together that can help CEOs to take specific actions to make that happen. All righty, I think we're five minutes past the hour. And um, I really want to thank you all for sharing this dinner moment uh, with me. Keep in touch for the next one. It's supposed to be monthly, um, but if people are too focused on eating rice for Christmas and then we're not able to hold it, I will also let you know. But if we're going to be available, uh, we usually have this monthly, then you can tell us in the chat, you know, where you might want us to focus on um, during the next uh, business dinner chat. So thank you all very much. I hope this has been very useful to you and that you have actually gotten a couple of ideas that you can implement in your business. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you all very much. And then you all have a wonderful evening until we'll speak again. Bye now.